Did you know that over 99% of pharmaceutical drugs start their journey as crude oil or natural gas? That's right, those everyday life-saving medications we often take for granted have deep roots with fossil fuels, the very same kind of substances powering our cars and heating our homes. But how exactly do we go from something seemingly basic as crude oil to something sophisticated like a life-saving medication? Today we are continuing that fascinating journey ourselves, step by step by synthesizing an influential pharmaceutical, Dilantin. Dilantin, chemically known as phenytoin, is an anticonvulsant medication, used extensively to manage seizures, especially with people living with epilepsy. Since its introduction in the 1930s, Dilantin has improved countless lives, becoming a cornerstone of treatment for millions of worldwide. Because of this, it finds its place on the World Health Organization list of essential medications. Millions may use this drug, but few people realize just how closely connected everyday medications like this are to raw resources beneath our feet. In a previous video, we began at the source, distilling crude oil to isolate a key compound called tylene. From there, we used radical chlorinization, a powerful and exciting chemical reaction, to convert that simple molecule into benzyl chloride. Benzyl chloride then became our building block for benzaldehyde, a versatile and valuable chemical that we will use as our starting point today. With the benzaldehyde ready and waiting, we are perfectly set up to perform several reactions that will ultimately yield dilantin and wrap up the video with an exploration of FTIR. The first chemical we are producing is called benzoin. We start this reaction by adding 2.7 grams of thiamine hydrochloride, also known as vitamin B1, with 6 milliliters of 10% aqueous sodium hydroxide into a 250 milliliter round bottle flask. This step converts the thiamine hydrochloride into a more reactive base form. The sodium hydroxide reacts with the HCl, preparing it for the next step of the reaction. Alternatively, we can use 1.5 grams of sodium cyanide, but that has more of a risk, so I'll stick with the B1. The trade-off is the reaction time. It jumps from 30 minutes with the cyanide to 90 with the B1. After dissolving the thymine, we add 30 grams of ethanol as our solvent, which will help keep all the components well mixed, and then we introduce 0.15 moles, approximately 15 milliliters of our benzaldehyde. Once all the reagents were in the flask, we add a stir bar, attach a condenser, and reflux the mixture in a hot water bath to drive the reaction forward. The reaction occurring is known as a benzoin condensation, where two benzaldehyde molecules join together to form benzoin, with thiamine, vitamin B1, acting as a catalyst. In simple terms, thiamine briefly changes the normal behavior of benzaldehyde. Normally, benzaldehyde is more likely to attract electrons, acting as an electrophile. But when thiamine activates it, the molecule turns into one that can donate electrons, acting as a nucleophile. This reversal allows one benzaldehyde molecule to attack another, forming a new carbon-carbon bond. After some rearrangement, the reaction produces benzoin, and regenerates the thiamine catalyst, ready to start the process over and over again. After 90 minutes, we remove the flask from the hot water bath, allowing the mixture to cool. To further encourage crystallization, we place the flask into an ice water bath. I tried soiling but no crystals, so a trick is to scrape the bottom of the flask with a stirring rod to promote crystallization. It does this by creating nucleation sites, places where crystallization can start. Once the product has fully crystallized, we collect it using suction filtration. We wash the crystals thoroughly with two 15 ml portions of 50% ethanol solution and several washings of water to ensure that any impurities such as unreacted benzaldehyde or leftover thiamine are removed. Finally, we let them filter to remove as much moisture as possible, and then spread them out in the air to dry. This process yielded 4.69 grams of final dry crystalline product, so we ended up with just 29% yield. Not exactly Nobel Prize material here, but all reactions are not perfect, sometimes things get finicky. The expected yield was 11 to 13 grams, which would have been a 68 to 81% yield. So what went wrong here? A few things could have occurred that led to a lower than expected yield. First, the reaction conditions themselves might not have been optimal. Temperature and consistencies in the hot water bath could have limited some effectiveness of the reflux, preventing complete benzaldehyde conversion. Second, the crystallization and filtration step could have caused additional product loss. If crystallization wasn't allowed to occur slow enough, some benzoin may have remained dissolved in solution and was inadvertently discarded by filtration. Moreover, excessive washing during filtration, even with cold ethanol and water, may have dissolved or mechanically removed some of the desired benzoin crystals. Lastly, the thymine catalyst, while safer, is inherently less reactive than sodium cyanide, 
possibly eliminating the reaction's efficiency. I wanted 8.5 grams for the next step, so I'll add an additional 3.81 grams from a test run to get us to the needed amount. Now we're ready to move on to the next step, converting benzoin to benzyl. First, let's carefully weigh out 4 grams of finely pulverized ammonium nitrate and place it into a clean dry 100ml round bottle flask equipped with a magnetic stir bar. Next, we add 8.5 grams of benzoin into the flask. Then we transfer 25 grams of glacial acetic acid into the flask. After the acetic acid, we carefully measure out about 5 milliliters of 2% cupric acid solution, which serves as a crucial catalyst to facilitate oxidation. Once our mixture is ready, it's time to set up the reaction. Attach a reflux condenser securely to the flask, and then place the assembly onto a hot plate immersed in a sand bath to provide stable even heating. We then start stirring and heating gently to initiate the reaction. As the mixture warms up, you'll notice it gradually transform into a clear green solution. One thing to see is the forming of bubbles. This is nitrogen gas being released, confirming ammonium nitrate's decomposition and active participation in oxidizing the benzoin to benzyl. This step is essential, as nitrogen evolution clearly indicates the oxidation is underway, allowing the solution to reflux gently but steadily for approximately 1.5 hours to ensure the reaction reaches completion. After the reaction is complete, we turn off the heating and allow the mixture to cool slightly, ideally to around 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. Now we pour this warm green solution carefully into 40 milliliters of ice cold water while continuously stirring. This sudden cooling will cause the benzyl to crystallize beautifully into vivid yellow crystals, separating from aqueous solution. Next, we need to collect our product. To do this, we set up suction filtration apparatus and filter the yellow benzyl crystals washing thoroughly with methanol or alternatively 75% aqueous ethanol. This step helps remove any impurities that might have adhered to the crystal surfaces. To confirm our oxidization has fully went to completion, we can perform a simple test for residual benzoin. Take a few crystals of our benzyl product and dissolve it into 1 ml of ethanol. We then add a single drop of sodium hydroxide solution. If any benzoin remains unoxidized, you'll see an immediate purple coloration. A clear solution, however, indicates that the oxidization was successful. The yield from our process typically falls between 7.5 grams to 8 grams. In our case, we achieved a solid 7.6 grams initially. To ensure maximum purity of our benzyl, we performed one final purification step, recrystallization. I transferred the product into a small beaker and dissolved it in the minimal needed amount of warm ethanol. The solution was then allowed to cool slowly, and this let pure benzyl crystals form and any impurities will remain dissolved. After cooling completely, I filtered the crystals once more, collecting 7.45 grams of pure benzyl. Now with our high quality benzyl is ready for the final transformation into our desired pharmaceutical product, Delantin. In this synthesis, we begin by carefully measuring and combining our reagents. 1 gram of benzyl, 1 gram of urea, followed by 15 milliliters of ethanol, and 3 milliliters of 30% aqueous sodium hydroxide into a small round bottom flask. The role of sodium hydroxide here is crucial. It deprotonates the urea, significantly increasing its nucleophilic nature and enabling it to effectively attack the carbonyl carbon groups present on the benzyl. With our reagents combined, we gently heat the mixture under mild stirring. This initiates the reaction, where the deprotonated, highly nucleophilic urea attacks the benzyl molecule. Specifically, the nucleophilic nitrogen in the urea targets the electrophilic carbonyl carbons in the benzyl, undergoing a nucleophilic addition reaction. This eventually leads to a ring closure with a benzylic rearrangement, forming a hydatin ring structure. After refluxing gently for approximately 1 to 1.5 hours, we allow the reaction to cool. Upon cooling, 25 milliliters of water is carefully added, promoting precipitation of an insoluble side product. This side product is impurity and byproducts, which have limited solubility in aqueous solutions and are rapidly separated by filtration. Following the filtration, the solution remains basic and contains our hydatin intermediate dissolved within it. To isolate the desired delantin, we acidify the filtrate carefully by adding dilute hydrochloric acid until the pH drops significantly. Acidification protonates the intermediate, dramatically reducing its solubility in water, causing it to crystallize. These newly formed crystals are then isolated by filtration and washed with cold water to remove any residual impurities, and were allowed to dry. Our yield at this point hovers just under 1 gram. 
It's essential to underscore that while dilatin is a highly effective anticonvulsant drug used to manage seizures, it must be administered under medical supervision. Dilantin carries potential risk and side effects including sedation, dizziness, and other neurological impacts. What I'm trying to say here is don't consume the drug that you just made. So the question now is how do we know we synthesized these chemicals that I said we made? That's where instrumental analytical chemistry comes in. We can take a look at the compounds at a molecular level. There are various instruments we can do this with. The one we'll be focusing on today is FTIR, which stands for Fourier Transfer Infrared Spectroscopy which is an essential analytic technique widely used in organic chemistry to determine molecular structure, verify functional groups, and assess the purity of chemical compounds. While it's still used today, more powerful techniques have gained popularity, such as NMR, but FTIR is a much cheaper instrument to get into. A simple FTR like this will run about $20,000, but to get a similar benchtop NMR, that runs north of $60,000. I should preface this section with the fact that a whole class can be taught on just this instrument. So treat this as an overview with enough information to make you dangerous and to get you familiar with the instrument. FTIR starts by shining a beam of infrared light through a sample. Infrared radiation lies in the invisible part of the electromagnetic spectrum, right between visible light and microwaves. Its wavelengths are longer than what we can see with our eye, but shorter than those used to heat your leftovers in the microwave. What's cool about infrared light is that its energy levels perfectly match up with the energy need to make chemicals bonds jiggle. And yes, we mean jiggle. Think of the bonds between atoms like a carbon-hydrogen bond, an oxygen-hydrogen bond, or a carbon-double bond-oxygen as tiny molecular springs. These springs naturally vibrate in a specific way. They can stretch like slinkies, bend like straws, twist, rock, or wag. The exact motion depends on the type of atom and how they're connected. Now, here's where bond energy comes in. Just like stretching a stiff spring takes more energy than stretching a loose one, stronger chemical bonds with higher bond energy need more infrared energy to get vibrating. So a carbon-oxygen bond, C double bond O, which is stiffer and stronger, will vibrate at a higher frequency and absorb shorter IR wavelengths than a looser carbon-hydrogen bond, carbon bond H. When infrared light passes through a sample, the molecules selectively absorb wavelengths that match their own bond vibrations. The rest of the light passes through. It's a bit like playing music to a room full of dancers, only the dancers whose favorite song is playing will get up and move. As a result, the infrared light that emerges from the sample has gaps, specific wavelengths that are missing because they are absorbed by the molecule's vibrating bonds. Each molecule leaves behind a unique pattern of missing light, like a fingerprint made of vibrations. But here's the twist. Just measuring the light that comes through isn't enough. We need to know exactly which wavelengths disappeared. That's where the Fourier transform comes in and a device called an interferometer comes in. It's like a mathematical decoder that helps us translate those missing pieces into a full spectrum. From there, scientists can identify which kinds of bonds are in the sample, and often what the sample's made of. With that rough overview done, we can now dive deeper into the parts of the instrument. The interferometer in an FTIR spectrometer is a device that precisely analyzes IR radiation by creating patterns of interference, essentially how two or more waves combine and overlap. This is crucial because directly measuring infrared absorption across a broad spectrum simultaneously would be challenging. Instead, the interferometer cleverly encodes information all about the wavelengths at once. So how does an interferometer work? First, an incoming beam of infrared radiation hits a component called a beam splitter, typically made from special materials such as a semi-reflective mirror that approximately reflects half of the IR radiation and transmits the other half. As a result, the original IR beam splits into two separate beams. One beam travels forward towards a stationary mirror called a fixed mirror. The other beam heads towards a mirror that is continuously moving back and forth, called the moving mirror. Since one mirror is moving and the other is stationary, the two IR beams travel slightly different distances, before being reflected back and recombining at the beam splitter. This creates a difference in the path length traveled by each beam. As the mirror moves back and forth, this path difference continuously changes. When the two beams recombine at the beam splitter, they interfere with each other, producing a pattern of constructive and deconstructive interference. Constructive interference occurs when waves meet in peak phases. The peaks align with each peak, amplifying the signal. In destructive interference, the waves meet out of phase, Peaks align with troughs, reducing or canceling the signal altogether. Because the mirror is moving constantly, shifting the distance traveled by one of the beams, the resulting interference continuously cycles between constructive and deconstructive patterns. 
This combined fluctuating signal recorded over time or mirror position is called interferogram. The interferogram is essentially a detailed record of how the different wavelengths in the IR beam interfere at different path length differences. When the combined IR beam passes through the sample, molecules within the sample selectively absorb certain wavelengths of infrared radiation. Each absorbed wavelength is effectively removed from the recombined IR beam. This selective absorption causes distinctive changes in the interferogram. Certain wavelengths that would otherwise contribute or interfere in the pattern are reduced or missing entirely, creating a characteristic alteration in the interferogram that encodes information about the sample's molecular structure. Initially, the interferogram appears as a complicated waveform rather than a distinct absorption spectrum. To extract meaningful information, the interferogram is processed through a mathematical operation called a Fourier transform. A Fourier transform mathematically converts the interferogram, a complex wave interference pattern, into a simpler, more understanding form consisting of a single absorbance at a single wavelength. These are then pieced together to form an absorption spectrum. This final spectrum clearly shows intensity versus frequency or wave number usually expressed in centimeters to the negative one. Peaks in the spectrum represent wavelengths that molecules have absorbed, effectively serving as a molecular fingerprint. In the context of synthesizing compounds in the lab like Delantin, FDR becomes particularly useful at each synthetic stage to confirm the successful transformation of starting material and intermediates into the desired product. I specifically chose to focus on FTR in this video because of how the functional groups change the different synthesis and we can see how these change directly with FTR. Let's begin with benzoin. The FTR spectrum provides critical evidence of benzoin condensation reaction and what success. Benzoin formed from benzaldehyde showcases characteristic peaks due to its unique structure. Specifically, the FTR spectrum from benzoin primarily displays a broad hydroxyl group, O bond H which typically appears around 3400 to 3200. This broad OH peak is missing in benzaldehyde itself due to it only having an aldehyde peak. Along with this change of a new OH, there are many distinctive characteristics of a benzoin condensation producing benzoin. So now we not only have physical change of benzaldehyde to a solid, but structural data to back up that change thanks to FTIR. When benzoin is oxidized to benzyl, a new set of identifiable changes emerged in the FTIR spectrum reflecting the chemical transformation clearly. Benzyl, a diketone structure, is readily distinguished by the disappearance of broad hydroxyl peaks present in benzoin, confirming the removal of the alcohol group during oxidization. Instead, benzyl exhibits two intense, distinctive carbonyl stretching vibrations occurring between 1685 and 1665. The absence of any broad peaks around 3400 signifies a successful oxidation reinforcing the purity and accuracy of the benzyl synthesis. It also helps that the material goes from a white powder to a bright yellow one. But once again, besides color change, we have structural data to back up that change. Finally, during the synthesis of Delantin 5,5-diphenylhydantin, the FTR analysis serves as indispensable confirmation tool for successfully synthesizing of hydantin ring formation. Delantin being a hydantin derivative features characteristic peaks that line up to its cyclic amine structure. Notably, Delantin exhibits a prominent absorption band characteristic of amine functional groups, specifically amine 1 and amine 2 band. The amine 1 band, predominantly associated with the carbonyl stretching vibration, typically appears clearly and strong near 1700, reflecting the presence of a lactam carbonyl group within the hydantin ring structure. Additionally, the amine 2 band, arising from an N bond H, produced by coupling of C N stretching, typically emerges around 1550 to 1500, confirming the successful ring closure and a nitrogen incorporation into the ring structure. All this comes together to say that we have successfully synthesized Delantin. I would like to thank you so much for joining us on our chemical journey today. Your support and engagement means the world to me, and I hope you found value in what I shared today. Every project is a step forward, and your presence here makes the steps even more meaningful. Now we're on to the next project. Thanks for watching.